Super King Sun scores again. Super King Sun was an artist lost in the politics of normal, assimilated life. Sure, his talents were often sidelined, as the store forced him to worry about importing enough spiky-looking fruits every month. He recruited way too many of our Mings to carry through custom suitcases filled with jackfruit, bras padded with lychees, and panties stuffed with we don't want to know. Sure, he reeked of raw chicken, raw chicken feet, raw cow, raw cow tongue, raw fish, raw squid, raw crab, raw pig, raw pig intestine, and raw like really raw pig blood, all jellied, cubed, and stored in buckets before it was thrown into everyone's noodle soup on Sunday mornings. When we walked into the barely air-conditioned store, we pinched our noses to stop from barfing all over aisle 6, which would ruin the only aisle with American products, the one with Cokes and Red Bulls and 10-year-old Lunchables no one ate. Though our moss would have shoved their shopping carts right through our vomit, without blinking an eye, without even noticing their puking grandchildren they'd seen much worse. And, sure, Super King's son wasn't nice. He could be cruel, incredibly so. Kevin won't talk to him anymore, and Kevin was our best smasher last season. Still, even with this in mind, and up our nostrils, we idolized Super King Sun. He was a regular Magic Johnson of badminton, if such a thing could exist, a legend, that is, for the young men of this Cambo hood, a niche fanbase, admittedly. The arcs of his lobs, the gentle drifts of his drops, and the lines of his smashes could be thought of, if rendered visible, as the very edge between known and unknown. He could smash a birdie so hard, make it fly so fast, we swore that when the birdie zipped by it shattered the force field suffocating us, the one composed of our parents' unreasonable expectations, their paranoia that our world could crumble at a moment's notice and send us back to where we started, starving and poor and subject to a genocidal dictator. Word has it that when Super King's son was young, he was an even better player, with a full head of hair. To us, Super King's son was our badminton coach, our shuttlecock king. That's who he would always be. But what was he for everyone else? Well, it's simple he was the goddamn grocery store boy. We looked to Super King's own for guidance on how to deal with our semi-racist teachers, who simultaneously thought we were enterprising hoodlums and math nerds that no speak English right, on whether wearing tees big enough to cover our asses was as dope as we hoped. And every time we had exciting news, some game-changing gossip we heard from our moss, like when Gong Suk went crazy from tending to his crop of reefer before he could sell even one bushel, we headed for Super King Grocery Store. So when Kyle informed us about the new transfer kid Justin whom he spotted smashing birdies and doing insane lunges across the court, being all Kobe Bryant at the local open gym, we dropped our skateboards and rushed to find Super King's son. We ran from our usual spot, the park where our peddling ants never set up shop, the one next to the middle school that shut down from gang violence, and we ran because we couldn't skate fast. Our baggy shirts went down to our knees, compromising our mobility, but who cares about mobility when you look as fly as this? It was February, and as chilly as a rainless California winter ever got, but we worked up a sweat doing all that running. By the time we found Super King's son in his back storeroom, we dripped beads of salty s water from head to toe. We were a crew of yellow-brown boys collapsed onto the floor, exhausted from excitement. Super King's son greeted us by raising his palm against our faces. You fools need to shut the fuck up so I can concentrate, he said, even though we hadn't uttered a word. He was talking to Cha K Factory's son about how many Khmer donuts he wanted to order that week. Super King's son stared intently at a clipboard, as if peering into its soul, his constant pen chewing the only sound we could hear. Come on, man, Cha K Factory son said, what's taking you so long? He grabbed the clipboard from Super King's son. Just go with the usual. Why do this song and dance every week? He pulled out his own unshoed pen, and then signed the invoice before anyone could whine about merchandising fraud. Fraud. Stop second guessing yourself, he added while shaking his head. God, I've aged 10 years waiting for you to make a decision. Stop giving me shit for being a good businessman, Super King's son said. This guy takes one econ class at Com, and now he's the CEO of Cambo Grocery Stores, Cha K Factory Sun teased, waving the clipboard around. Like he's Steve Jobs, and those spoiled Chinese sausages are MacBook Airs.
Super King Sun crossed his arms over that semi-pudgy chest over that layer of fat that had grown at a steady rate since he took over the store. All right, he said, everyone out of my storeroom. Y'all are sweaty as fuck, and I don't want this asswipe smell sticking to my inventory. I sell food people put in their mouths, damn it. We urged our coach to wait, each of us frantic for approval. We raved about Justin, how he could replace Kevin as our team's number one player, how Kyle swore he had served the best drop shots he had witnessed in the open gym all year. The open gym at Delta College? Super King Sun said, sarcasm stretching his every syllable into one of those diphthongs we learned about in sophomore English. An entire Shakespearean monologue nestled in the gaps between his words. That's not saying much. At that open gym, I've seen players smack their doubles partners in the face with their rackets. We only wanted to make the team better, so Super King Sun's reaction disheartened us. Yet it wasn't different from what we had grown to expect from him. It wasn't worse than that time a pregnant and morning sick Ming was found vomiting into the frozen tuna bin, ruining a whole month's worth of fishy profits, which inspired him to assign us 200 burpees every day for a week. And it was nowhere close to that time his mom, while sweeping, slipped in the produce section and broke her hip, next to the bok choy of all places. We're sure this was the moment he started balding. Balding. By his fifth medical payment, he looked like Bruce Willis in yellow brownface. We told ourselves Super King's son was simply stressed out. Everyone, including our own parents, relied on him to supply their food. He needed to restock his shelves for the upcoming month or else mayhem would commence, we told ourselves, as if the store didn't need to be restocked every month. Bring the kid to conditioning, and we'll see how quickly one of you bastards gets whacked in the head. He stepped over our bodies, grabbed the door, and looked down on us. I'm serious, he said. Get out or I'm locking you guys in here. His biceps flexed, that small part of his arm begging to be bigger than it was. Chake Factory Sun started to leave first, but as he approached the door, he slid behind Super King Sun. He massaged the shoulders of our coach, digging his big, donating hands into that perpetually tense and sore tissue. We watched as Super King Sun's eyebrows furrowed in revolt, even as his mouth was forming silent moans of pleasure. It's okay, Chake Factory Sun said. Let's give this big boy his alone time so he can think about business. Then he patted him on the stomach and jolted out the door. Super King Sun reached out to grab Cha K Factory Sun, almost falling over in the process. He missed, by more than he would ever admit. And as he leaned forward into the gaping hole of the doorway, watching his vendor flee from his grasp, we could tell he wanted to scream out some last remark. But he didn't. He probably couldn't decide on anything to say. There are stories of Super King Son you wouldn't believe. Epic stories, stories that are downright implausible given the laws of physics, gravity, the limitations of the human body. There's the one where Super King's son's doubles partner sprained his ankle during the final match of sectionals. The kid dropped to the ground, right in the middle of the court, and Super King's son fended off the smashes of Edison's two best varsity players by lunging over his partner's injured body. He kept this up for 10 minutes until one of the Edison players also slipped and sprained his ankle, resulting in a historic win for our high school's badminton team. They later learned the floor had been polished by the janitors, who neglected to tell the badminton coaches. The guys who sprained their ankles sued the school, won a huge settlement, and now both have their own houses in Sacramento. Three bedrooms, two and a half bathrooms, everything you could possibly want. Then there are the many times he's beaten Cha K Factory Sun in a singles match, often without letting him score a single point. Once, Super King Sun bet Cha K Factory Sun $100 he could beat him while eating a Big Mac, one hand gripped around his racket, the other around a juicy burger. Cha K Factory Sun agreed, but wanted to triple the bet on the stip stipulation that Super King Sun could not spill even a shred of lettuce. Halfway through, Super King's son had played so well, he got his friend to throw him another Big Mac, then a box of 10 McNuggets. At the end of the match, the gym floor remained spotless. Cha K Factory's son refused to eat at McDonald's for 10 years.
We didn't believe the stories at first. We thought, Super King's son's talking out of his ass. He wants to hype himself up to kids over a decade younger than him. That was why he allowed us to practice skating tricks in the parking lot and gave us free Gatorades, albeit the yellow flavor no one bought, never the light blue. Then, after we had entered high school, Super King's son took over as the coach of our badminton team. Just as he'd carried his own peers as a class-ditching player in the 90s, he coached our team through a regional championship. There weren't opportunities to compete at state or nationals, no D1 recruiters scouting matches with athletic scholarships in their S pockets. This was badminton, for God's sake. Super King Sun launched us to the very top of the Central Valley standings the first time we called ourselves number one at anything. But more than that, from the little gestures the fluid flare of his wrists when demonstrating how to hit, his ability to pick up birdies, with only his racket and foot, and send them flying across the gym to any player he chose, the way he tapped into rallies, making shots with his left hand so as not to annihilate the kid he was coaching we had realized the stories were true. Justin was not impressed that he was the new kid who showed up to school driving a baller Mustang, and parked it next to Kyle's minivan, which was one of those beat-up machines abandoned at the local car shop and then flipped and sold to Cambo ladies like Kyle's mom, who had prayed and prayed for the miraculous day their eldest children could start chauffeuring around their youngest. We could tell, from the way Justin spiked his jet-black hair into pointy peaks, that he had the clearest intentions to paint red, yellow, and blue flames on the driver's side of his Mustang. So no, Justin was not impressed with the abandoned parking lots we hung out in, the mall that did so badly Old Navy closed down, the pop-up restaurants located in Camber-rented apartments where we slurped steaming cups of cooey tea and roach-infested kitchens, and he definitely did not see what we saw in Super King Sun. But Justin, despite the pretensions, was a damn good badminton player. Plus, after school let out, he bought us rounds of dollar menu chicken sandwiches, giving us rides in his Mustang while we inhaled that mystery meat. And we saw where he was coming from, because this year Super King's son was indeed off. Conditioning was a shit show. Two weeks of Super King's son showing up late, his clothes stained with sweat, we hoped it was sweat, fish guts and pig intestines all stuck in his hair and stinking up the joint. Two weeks of him miscounting lunges and crunches and not stopping us from planking until we fell to the ground in pain he was constantly checking his phone instead of keeping track of what we were doing. And he kept forgetting Kyle's name. Kyle, whose dad visited Super King grocery store every week to buy lottery tickets and fish oil pills. Gotta be healthy for when I'm rich, Kyle's dad often said, kissing both his ticket and his pills for good luck. Kyle, who Super King's son practically watched grow up, as his own ma used to babysit Kyle when Kyle was still in diapers. Babysitting, for her, entailed hours of pushing a naked infant in a shopping cart, up and down every aisle of the store. What's up with your coach, anyway? Justin asked one day, while driving a couple of us home after practice. I don't mean to be a, a hater, he continued, but I could get better conditioning doing Tai Chi with the ladies in the park. Like, only the left half of my body is getting a workout, man, like if I kept doing this, my muscles will get all imbalanced and I'll topple over. Not sure ourselves, we told him there was nothing to worry about, because sometimes Super King Sun got caught up with the store. Sometimes our coach was so stressed out he didn't think straight. It's amazing that store makes money looking the way it does, Justin said. It's such a dump. I hope you guys are right though. My mom's getting on my case about college applications. She wants me to quit badminton and join Model UN, but I keep telling her that the coach is supposed to be this legend and the team can win a bunch of tournaments. Don't get me wrong, I want to keep playing badminton, but... I mean, Model UN does have cute girls. Girls that wear cute blazers. And know stuff about the world. As Justin trailed off, Thinking about all the girls he could woo with his faux diplomacy and political strategy, we saw him slipping away from our world. We saw this college-bound city city kid, this Mustang-driving badminton player, how he might be too good for our team, our school, our community of Cambos. Sure, Justin was Cambodian, but he seemed so different. That's what happens when your dad's a pharmacist, we thought. 
Whenever you wanted, whenever things stopped benefiting you, or whenever you simply got bored, you could just whip out something else, like a skill set in Model UN. We had the Mind 2 THRO on intervention for Super King Sun. We needed to do something to keep Justin around. Every day for a week, we met during lunch as a team sans Justin and sans Super King Sun, obviously to discuss intervention strategies, our evidence and counterarguments, who would say each point and in what order, and where each of us would stand to demonstrate the appropriate amount of solidarity. We even made contingency plans, which detailed an escape route if Super King's son were to freak out and start chucking produce at our heads, it happened more often than not. But when we got to the store, ready for a confrontation, we found Super King's son in the back room surrounded by what came across as a militia, minus the rifles and bulletproof vests. We saw our Hennessy-drenched uncles, the older half-siblings no one dared to talk about, and those cousins who attended our school but never seemed to be present at roll call. Hiding behind the stacked crates, we spied on them. Super King's son was in the center of the circle, staring intently at the floor. His hands seemed stuck to his chin. Some ghostly vision played out in front of his eyes, and it shocked the color out of his face. Chake Factory Sun was there too, his hands on Super King Sun's shoulders, like he was both consoling him and holding him back from doing something stupid. A wave of money flashed around the circle, stopping only to be counted and recounted, probably to make sure no one had slipped any bills into his pocket. We spied on these men, each of us brainstorming reasons for this meeting that were innocent and harmless, not doomed by the laws of faux Buddhist, karmic retribution. If we're being honest with ourselves, none of us figured out a reason worth a damn. Badminton practice only worsened. Super King's son coached everyone who wasn't Justin, hardly acknowledged his existence, really, not even to reprimand him. Yet when we crowded around a Justin match and cheered as he nailed smash after smash, we swore we saw Super King's son in awe of his talent, analyzing Justin's form and failing to find any faults. Sometimes we saw something darker, something seething, within his stares, some envy-fueled plot being calculated in his expression, but then he'd break his gaze from Justin. He'd check his phone for the thousandth time and allow anxiety about his father's store to overtake, yet again, his love for badminton. Justin, for his part, ignored Super King's son's directions and went through practices entirely on his own agenda. That first week, they interacted only through overriding each other's instructions to Justin's hitting partner, Ken, that poor, we mean this literally, an unfortunate schmuck. Every practice, Super King's son told Ken to practice his drop shots, Justin said smashes, Super King's son yelled at Ken for not doing drop shots, Justin still refused to change drills, Super King's son made Ken do laps around the court for undermining his authority, and so on until Ken bailed on practice. practice hid in the locker room, and smoked a cigarette for his nerves. He stole packs from his dad, who bought wholesale Marlboro Reds from Costco. His dad handed them out to relatives in Cambodia like candy, in an effort to pretend he was a hotshot tycoon of the American stock market. Shit escalated one day when Super King's son was so late that Justin, fed up with waiting, assumed the role of the coach and started practice. We knew that Super King's son would be pissed. We'd seen him fire cashiers for breaking his policy of absolutely no double bagging and butchers for using his personal office bathroom. Of course, he always rehired who he fired, regardless of how much pig blood they got on his toilet and fake granite tile, because his mom would hear from so-and-so's ming about so-and-so's kids needing food on the table and braces to fix their fucked up teeth, because they couldn't eat said food on the table with overbites or crooked ass incisors. At the same time, we were with Justin. We felt his exasperation. We looked like a gang of dopey assholes on the floor of the gym, sitting in our butterfly stretches, acting like we were doing substantial exercises, so the janitors would refrain from kicking everyone out to start polishing the floor. Justin had charisma, so he was able to take charge of us high schoolers the same age as him, more or less, and not sound like a douche. For once, practice was going smoothly, with nothing jamming the flow of our hitting drills, no kinks or delays, or conflicting instructions. We became a well-oiled machine of flying birdies, of perfect wrist technique. Not a single one of us smacked another player in the head with a racket. What the hell is going on here? 
Someone yelled, and we looked over to find Super King's son at the double doors. His phone seemed permanently attached to his hand, he was gripping it so hard. Muffled voices, all sinister and incomprehensible, issued from the speakers. You weren't here, so I started everyone on drills, Justin replied, his back facing our coach. He resumed correcting the way Kyle was gripping his racket, while Super King's son stormed across the gym. Soon they were standing within inches of each other. The eyes of Super King's son were fiery. Justin stayed cold. You wanna repeat that, boy? Super King's son said, sounding like he was competing in a who can breathe more heavily contest. He straightened his posture, locking his shoulders in place, and we noticed how much taller Justin was than our coach. We waited over an hour. You expected us to sit around doing nothing until you got here? Only a whiff of defiance, of sarcasm, could be heard in Justin's voice, but still, Super King's son puffed up his chest. Still, his face blazed with anger, the red color rushing to his hairless scalp. We braced our ourselves for Super King's son to power up into fire-breathing uncle mode, for Justin's even-toned facade to disintegrate in the face of pent-up refugee shit and the frustration of premature balding. We thought this was the last of Justin the effective team captain, the stand-in coach, or at least that their confrontation would make practices even more awkward, and then drive Ken into a full-blown, black lungs kind of smoking addiction. Super King's son sucked in a deep breath, and right when we thought he was on the verge of exhaling some great A-level beef insults, hesitation rippled through his expression. Maybe he'd realized it was petty for a business owner, a full-ass adult who paid taxes, to pick fights with a baby-faced high school junior. He could have been the level-headed coach we knew he could be. Super King's son, after all, was one of the good Cambo dudes. He didn't belong to that long legacy of shitty guys, who spent their adulthood sleeping on their mom's couch and eating their mom's food. Kevin's older brother, for instance, had a decent job at the DMV and still, he lived with his mom, paid her jack shit in rent, and never did chores because he was too busy playing his video games. One day his mom snapped, of course, how could she not? She ended up lighting his PlayStation on fire, just as he was reaching the end of a Call of Duty campaign. By taking over the grocery store, Super King's son had done right by his father's life. He had sustained his father's hard work, work, and made sure that that poor refugee's lifetime of suffering didn't go to waste. We looked up to Super King's son. We wanted to keep it that way. A dial tone emitted from his phone, and its dull beat gradually subdued Super King's son. Everyone go back to what you were doing, he yelled, before scrambling his way to the exit. Frantically, he called back the person he was so afraid of snubbing, and as he disappeared into the hallway, we heard him chant, sorry, 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 off into the distance. The next WEEK Super King son posted the roster for our first meet of the season. We crowded around the sheet, ready to be disappointed or excited by our ranking, to see if we had secured a lucrative JV or varsity spot, or whether God help us, Humble Buddha bless us Super King's son had cast us aside to the exhibition matches, where we would rot away with the freshmen. We knew Justin would be rank one for varsity singles the official team captain. For weeks, we'd been saying that he would destroy the other rank one players, to the point of making them all cry, even the smug kid from Edison with the racket that cost a thousand dollars. Joke was on him, he got scammed into buying a counterfeit Yonix Deluxe by Kyle's enterprising cousin. Come on, guys, hurry up, Justin said, standing behind us with his arms crossed. I want to score some food from the 7-Eleven. Slowly, each of us turned our heads. We stared at him. What's the deal? He asked. You know I need my steak and cheese taquitos. It straight up stunned us, the revelation that Justin was not rank 1 for varsity singles, not even rank 2, but a laughable rank 3. Our jaws dropped to the floor, we were speechless. Ken who was now rank 1, our appointed team captain, and totally un unprepared to take on that burden started breathing so heavily he was almost hyperventilating, the cigarettes didn't help. But Justin only stood there, silent, staring at the roster, though there was so much space between him and that piece of paper, who knew where he was looking.
Maybe Justin was scheming a course of action, a vengeful and ingenious plot, that challenged Super King Sun's decision. He could raise hell the way his mom did when Mr. White had the gall to give him AB- on his Civil War paper. He could also quit, call it a day, and take his taquitos home to eat. Studying his face, we couldn't tell exactly what he was thinking or feeling. What we did see wasn't so much anger as pity. It was sad for Super King's son to stoop this low. Here was one of the good Cambo dudes, fucking over a teenager half his age. Maybe we saw in Justin's expression what we all thought ourselves. This time we confronted Super King's son, for real. We found him sitting on a footstool, in the aisle at the edge of the building, where customers hardly ever went. Surrounding him were pots and pans, cheap oriental dishes and bowls, and the incense packets for praying that Moss bought to convert their bedrooms into DIY mausoleums for those who had died in the genocide. We squinted because the store's lights didn't reach this aisle, and we looked down on him because he was basically squatting on the ground. Please, coach, we pleaded, you have to reconsider the rankings for our team. Don't you fools get tired of coming to my shithole? He asked in a daze, looking straight through us, either at some vision of his life, or at the spilled rice he would be sooner or later, later, after harassing his cashiers to do the job force to sweep up himself. We appealed that we were being serious, that it didn't make sense for Justin to be ranked three, not even in terms of stacking our roster against other teams. We would lose all our number one and number two matches, we argued. Super King Sunside, not really registering our words. His face beamed the mugshot look that our gongs wore when we dragged them to eat unlimited soup, salad, and breadsticks at the Olive Garden that expression of unresisting contempt. Badminton, he said, and sighed again. My body was made for it, I swear. Never had to think, formulate decisions, be all stressed out when I played a match. I just... Did it, you know? I used to think, like really I fucking did, that something about cambos like me, cambos who grew in the real hood, just made for good badminton. We didn't have it as good as you guys do now. We dealt with a fuckload of bullshit. He spread his arms wide, signaling to us that the store was simply that, a fuckload of bullshit. Or maybe he was referring to us, our problem with his latest decision as a coach, how we always consulted him for guidance, and the pressure of, of living up to all our bullshit. Super King's son went on talking, and a couple of us peeled off to grab Gatorades and snacks. We needed sustenance to keep listening to his tirade on the generational ethics of badminton. You motherfuckers will never really get it, he said. Just like those deadbeats my age, who will never understand the Pol Pot crap. We began stuffing our mouths with Funyuns wrapped in dry seaweed. We asked him how any of this was related to our team roster, with Justin's ranking, with us. How many times do I have to hammer this into your dense skulls? He said. Badminton is a balancing act. You need both strength and grace. You need to smash the birdie with just the flick of your wrist. None of that tennis nonsense of swinging with your whole stupid arm. And to master the gentle tap of a drop shot, you gotta use the force of your entire body to lunge across the court. Then you halt your momentum, right before impact, and make the hit. You think your all-star player is good, but I've seen him driving around that tacky-ass Mustang. For a second, we were scared that he would call us out for getting rides from Justin, for buying into his richness. He's a spoiled dipshit, Super King's son continued. His dad walks around like that flashy pharmacy makes him better than the rest of us. And his mom, don't get me started she doesn't even shop here. She considers my store beneath her, can you believe that? You should hear the way his parents talk big and proud to anyone stupid enough to listen. They brag and brag that their son's a genius, that he will go to a real university, that he studies so fucking hard, like he's slaving away by reading SAT books and studying calculus. Man, that dumbass kid doesn't know shit ab about working hard. Which means he doesn't know shit about badminton because badminton takes work real work. You gotta practice until your racket wrist feels like it's on fire. When I was your age, I used to do conditioning workouts while stocking these very shelves. I'd curl boxes of those fucking chips you're eating, with only my wrists. 
Just then, he jerked backward and knocked over a stack of dishes, which prompted half of us to nearly choke on our Funyuns. We had no response to Super King Sun, of course, partly because of his crazed logic, but mostly because we didn't agree. It was hard to do well in school, especially as a cambo. And weren't we supposed to aspire to the status of Justin's family? Weren't we supposed to attend college and become pharmacists? Wasn't that what our parents had been working for? Why our ancestors had freaking died? But we couldn't think of how to express this, how to reason against a guy who carried so much emotional baggage that we almost felt obligated to tip him for his labor. Shit, Super King's son said, badminton was the only thing that made me happy. What a goddamn joke. He dropped his face into his palms. This place is so fucked. We looked around the store at the meat counter lined with blood and guts, at the sacks of long grain rice piled to the ceiling, and at the oily Khmer donuts supplied by Cha K Factory Sun, the ones that tasted so good it was difficult not to eat yourself sick. All of a sudden, the building looked sparser, sparser, paler, like the walls had caught the flu. Were the fluorescent lights dying above us and messing with our vision? Had we never seen the store from this aisle? We asked, why not take a break from coaching, just for a couple of weeks? We urged Super King's son to focus on his father's business, assured him that in the meantime, we could run practices on our own. Justin could watch over our drills and give us pointers, though we didn't mention this last point. We weren't dumbass. We sensed that the store was off, and we needed him to fix it. I can't stay here all day. There's no good reason. We watched him slowly rise to his feet. He prepared himself to face whatever had driven him to the aisle in the first place. This store. Disgusts me, he said, mostly to himself. It always has. He brushed his shirt off, like he saw what was so disgusting crawling over his belly, like the literal essence of Super King grocery store had laid claim to his body. It was QUIE the next few days. Super King's son kept cancelling practices, ordering us each time to stay at home and rest. We noticed strange behaviors, and no one would explain them to us, not our loudmouth Mings and Moss, not Cha K Factory son why Super King's son had closed the store randomly in the middle of the weekday, why he had failed to appear at Kevin's second cousin's engagement party. Justin too was a mystery. He skulked the halls, calculating his next move against Super King's son. At lunch, he ranted that not holding practices, so close to an upcoming meet, was an affront to our manhoods. The afternoon when practice resumed, Justin bought us bean and cheese burritos, and even splurged on a 44-ounce mango slurpee that we all passed around. He didn't mention Super King Sun the entire school day. His attitude struck us as weird, but we would never turn down free food. We hadn't received a break since Kyle's half-sister's other half-brother was promoted to assistant store manager at the nice Walmart. Every cambo in the hood had enjoyed the hookup, with a 10% discount and extra food samples, until the dude got himself fired for hooking up with his girlfriend in the bathroom. Stretching and warm-up went as smooth as ever, in the sense that Super King's son was typically late and not present. Justin offered to lead us through some drills. At first, we were hesitant. It'll be chill, he said, too eager in his voice to sell us on the chill factor. What's the worst that could happen? And, obviously, the worst did happen. Okay, maybe not the worst, regardless, shit went down when Super King Sun walked in, looked up from his text messages, and found himself amidst a shuttlecock tornado, before getting whacked in the head, with a racket, by a clueless freshman. What the fucking shit is going on here? He yelled, after grabbing the freshman's racket and throwing it to the ground. In response, Justin began cracking up either hysterically or fake hysterically. He hunched over, his arms wrapped across his stomach. You wanna start something, don't you? Super King Sun said, pointing at Justin. You're trying to get me all riled up. Good job, Einstein, you totally found me. Everyone turned toward Justin. He was walking through the players, stepping on fallen birdies along the way. I challenge you to a match, he now said, stopping in front of our coach. 
Reactions of confusion and doubt ran through the team while Ken suddenly gasped for air. Which was probably that smoker's lung he was developing. You're serious? Super King Sun said, imparting to his words as much condescension as possible. Though it hardly mattered, as Justin's posture was completely upright to emphasize his height. Yeah, and if I win, Justin said, you gotta make me rank one. Super King Sun bellowed an unsettling laugh. What's gonna happen when you lose? Then I'll quit, Justin said. As simple as that. You won't have to deal with me undermining your whole I'm the coach and I demand respect routine. That's boring, Super King Sun scoffed. Fine, Justin said, if I lose, I'll serve as designated birdie collector for every practice and meet. Our own ears perked up at this. This proposal cleaning up the mess of white feathering nubs was easily the worst thing about competitive badminton. And I'll shut the fuck up and stay at rank 3. Super King Sun yanked the racket out of Kyle's hands. Deal, you stupid shit. We crowded around the centermost court, the only spot that was well lit by the crappy lights. Super King Sun offered Justin the first shot saying, show me what you got, as he handed over the birdie and right as Justin served, Super King Sun charged to the net. He smashed the birdie so hard it ricocheted off the ground and whacked Ken in the face, imprinting a massive red welt. Dams and oh his came from the team as Ken yelled, my face. My fucking face. From the beginning, the two opponents were akin to dance partners. Super King Sun lobbed the birdie, but Justin only drove it back, resulting in a grand volleying of net killings, no one scoring for what seemed like forever. Then Justin deployed a series of risky drop shots, with Super King Sun, as he trained us to do, always springing forward in a powerful anticipation that Justin, like clockwork, braced himself against using that flawless gripping technique of his. And of course, it goes without saying, whenever one of them jumped into the air for a smash, the other crouched to the floor and retrieved the thunderous strike, recovering quickly from the bruises piling up on his shins. The most beautiful and impressive badminton unfolded before our eyes. Their playing fed off their opponent with the intensity of two moss trash-talking their grandchildren. Feet glided across the court, bouncing, lunging, leaping. Rack racket strings trembled. Birdies flew impossibly close to the net. Both were so effortless in their technique, so in tune with their own and each other's bodies, they appeared otherworldly, steered by a godlike puppeteer. We exclaimed at every point an unthinkable save. We rooted until all the incredible smashes averaged out into the same perfect shot. And then our voices crapped out on us. Our tired eyes found their sheer athleticism routine. The second half of the match turned downright boring. Instead of paying attention, some of us opened our textbooks and studied. Ken lay down on the bleachers with an ice pack attached to his swollen cheek. Others busted out a deck of cards and started a round of Big Two. If anything, the Big Two game became more riveting. Kyle squandered his ace of hearts, lost ten bucks, and completely upended his weekend plans the bet required the loser to drive the winner's ma to the temple, the one in the boonas next to the bad Walmart. Super King Sun and Justin were too good. They predicted each other too well. Neither player ever gained more than a two-point lead. There was no drama, no tension or grit, no underdog who could rebound and surprise us. And when Super King Sun scored that final winning shot, no one really gave a shit. Even Justin seemed apathetic. But Super King Sun gave tons of shits. He pranced around his side of the court, ran victory laps, and stomped his feet so hard we're pretty sure our half-deaf, half-dead, he should retire but tenure is cushy on the pension sucks post-housing crisis teacher of boring British plays and poems, it was no wonder why kids barely make it to community college, heard him from across campus. He yelled fuck yes. Over and over, like outplaying and defeating a high schooler was better than all the sex he'd ever had, which was probably true, given his luck with women. He shifted into the cambo taunt mode of our elders, donning the same antagonism our moms did whenever we tried to buy new shoes not on sale, our dads whenever we prioritized our homework over the family business, our moss and gongs whenever they heard our shameful Khmer accents, 
and our siblings and cousins whenever we dared to complain about the responsibilities they had previously shouldered, about enduring what could never match what had already happened to everyone we know. Who else wants a piece of me? Super King Sun yelled, beating his chest with his racket-free hand. He traversed half the gym to direct his taunts not only at Justin, but also at every guy in the room. None of you have what it takes. None. He seemed blinded with misguided passion, the bulging veins of his fat neck pumping blood straight to his eyeballs. Get out of my fucking face. We felt the spit flying from his slobbering mouth and onto our skin. Our memories fade around the time Super King's son was challenging us to matches, even the poor freshman on the exhibition team, pointing with his racket at kid after kid and repeating, come on. Show me what you got. Like a robot stuck in an infinite loop. What we remember was this, the shock of witnessing Super King's son's inflated ego spurting all over the gym. Our bodies settling into pity. We looked at our beloved coach, an overgrown son prone to anxious, envious tantrums, who was fed up with his place and inheritance, who was perpetually made irritated, disgusted, paranoid, by his own being, and then we looked at each other. Right there in the gym, Super King Sun screaming in our faces, we made the collective decision, silently, almost telepathically, that one, Super King Sun was an asshole, a tragic one, but still an asshole, two, we had too many assholes in our shitty lives, and three, we didn't have enough asswipes to deal. Look, what can we say, we were busy. We had our own responsibilities and expectations we were always on the verge of failing. And sure, there were signs. Tons of them, if we're being honest. First, our moss started complaining about the lack of fresh vegetables and fruit. Green papayas as old as their concentration camp surviving eyes were decaying on the shelves of the produce section. Then shadowy cambos started rolling into the store, not to shop for rotting papayas, that was for sure. They rushed through the aisles, sometimes with loads of packages, sometimes in the middle of the afternoon, sometimes at closing, never to be seen exiting, exiting the premises. After a while, Super King Sun banned us from the back storeroom altogether. That giant bulky guy, the ex-army cambo, the one took Kevin's sister to prom, guarded the door behind the meat counter. Super King Sun hardly ever trekked there himself, not even to play spider solitaire on his ancient HP computer. We'd seen it happen to Cambo businesses before. We saw it when Angkor Noodles lady hired a cook who made soggy s noodles. The old cook pulled a classic drunk dad he went on a bender for a week. When his wife found him, he was passed out at a roulette table in Reno and had gambled away their daughter's college fund. Angkor Noodles lady borrowed more and more money from the higher-up cambos. Each month she promised to pay them back the full amount, plus whatever interest that had accrued, once her business picked up. Business never picked up, the cooey teeve was that soggy and gross, and the restaurant floated on cambo community money until Angkor Noodles lady finally decided to ditch town. Hiding out in Bakersfield, in the guest room of her nephew's house, she nursed a boxed wine addiction until she died of liver complications. Now, now, Super King's son isn't dead, don't worry. We see him out all the time, usually at the good foe place, usually with Cha K Factory son, who has been ranting about the same bad investment plan for years. It involves mass-producing in neon party colors those weird suction cups that make Cambo moms look like they're getting abused to people with white savior complexes. When the store closed and Super King's son had nothing to offer the higher-up cambos, not even his back room to use as their headquarters, his own mother saved his skin by selling her house and paying off his debts. We don't know how Super King's son makes a living anymore, but sometimes, if you're lucky, he'll appear at an open gym. He'll play a match or two, give some pointers on form. His lunges and smashes will strike you as impressive for someone his age, someone who probably has knee and wrist pain. Halfway through the session, he'll leave the player queue and perch on the bleachers. He'll watch a crew of younger cambos play the game that, according to him, was the only thing that made him worthwhile as a person. When open gym is over, you'll drive home, and if you're taking Pershing Avenue to Manchester Street, you'll pass what remains of Super King Grocery Store. And even though the building has been empty for years, gathering dust and gang signs like flies to a pile of bloody meat, 
even though the community has moved on to bigger and better shit, like college degrees and Costco bulk food, you'll swear, on the graves of all those murdered cambos, on every cupping bruise your mom self-inflicts to rid her flesh of trauma, we promise you'll swear that the stench of raw fish, and raw everything else, never got the memo to quit and relax. Seriously, you can trust us.